Hey everyone, it's time for the next Chebcast. Today we're going to be discussing Elder Scrolls Necromancy. And we're here today with Jinx. Hello there. And hopefully later on Sohai will show up. Because he's got really good like knowledge of the lore, especially regarding Morrowind, which I don't have that much knowledge about. In any case, I basically poured through all the books from Oblivion, Skyrim, and Morrowind to kind of like figure out the best uh, lore-based necromancy info because I didn't really want to get anything wrong with this because, well, firstly, I don't want to contribute to misinformation, but secondly, I don't want a whole, peop a whole horde of people telling me that I'm wrong. So I tried to just go straight to the source and just comment on that alone. I guess a, a good place as any to begin with this is basically um, a little bit about how uh, necromancy is viewed in the Elder Scrolls and most people already know that it's basically frowned upon but there's a really good book and it's available in Morrowind it's called Volume 1 The Acquisition of the Corpse and it's basically an account of the challenges that necromancers face in each province when they try to get their hands on corpses and it's written by a Breton necromancer from High Rock and to begin we'll just cover Morrowind basically the only place where necromancy is illegal, like actually strictly illegal, is in Morrowind. But generally speaking, it's frowned upon in the entire empire. In Cyrodiil, there's certain privileged necromancers that have served the empire, and they're able to use necromancy on corpses for research, and they're provided these legally. For, for necromancers in Morrowind, the temple will investigate desecrations, but if you're careful, you can get by using corpses from the slave trade. In Black Marsh, it's pretty difficult to do any necromancy because of the conditions in like the jungle and stuff, the rapid decay and stuff like that. Only slowed necromancers are known to use necromancy successfully there. And of course, the slowed are really interesting. In Elsewhere, the forests pose the same problems as in Black Marsh. But in the deserts, it's really good for necromancy because the corpses are well preserved and the Khajiit also don't care much about their dead. Like they don't hide them or bury them well either. There's usually just like a can stone or whatever. So you can dig the corpses up. Vainland wood is a real problem because of the cannibalistic nature of the Bosma. So it's heavily stigmatized there. In Somerset Isle, it's basically pretty racist. Like. High elves can do it, but anyone else can't. And even like rich and sort of noble families can study necromancy out in the open publicly. But if you're a foreigner there and you do it, then you get punished like really harshly. But the no but the necromantic research there is limited to basically extending lifespans rather than making legions of undead. Hammerfell is a big problem because it's where worship of RK is the strongest. And the problem with RK is that corpses that are buried with RK's rituals or whatever, they've got some kind of like anti-necromancy stuff built in, so you can't resurrect a corpse that's been blessed by RK that easily. So you basically have to rely on battlefields. In Orsinium, the status of necromancy is unknown, but all corpses are highly sought after because of their strong skin and strong bones and all of that. And in High Rock, cremation is heavily practiced, so it's difficult to get corpses there. But in the south of High Rock, there's cemeteries due to imperial influence, and there's also battlefields left over. In Skyrim, the cold weather and isolation allows, necromancies to, allows necromancers to operate pretty freely. But the problem is, is that corpse availability is limited to Nords. The cold preserves the corpses, but the snow makes them hard to find. Thras is, of course, the best place for necromancy because the Slode live there and they're famous necromancers, but not much is really known about them. And finally, a really interesting point from this book is that using animal corpses for necromancy is ineffective. This is because animals that are resurrected are unable to follow commands, and they think the reasoning for this is because the intelligence of the creature transfers over into undef. So if you want a, a minion that's capable of following orders, you basically need humanoids. And if you reanimate an animal, basically you're going to be attacked by it because it won't be able to distinguish you from everyone else as its master. So I think that was some really interesting stuff.
What do you think about that, Jinx? It's a lot of information uh, that's pretty good to have in a fictional world because a lot of fictional worlds sort of take every single culture and uh, just sort of summarize them together as they hate necromancers because they are bad. But there's a lot of uh, different reasonings for the different cultures uh, on Nern to hate the idea of necromancy. Um, but some of the interesting points uh, just from doing my own research is uh, one of the more fascinating aspects of different cultures viewing necromancy differently is I think that the Dark Elves and Morrowind in general are rather hypocritical because in a way they use necromancy continuously they just refuse to call it that um, and that's through their usage of ancestor defense um, so essentially because the Dark Elves revere their ancestors a lot the desecration of their corpses is strictly forbidden as you said it's illegal there so having them tampered with in any way is punishable by death because they revere their their ancestors so much however uh when dark elves are threatened or whenever dark elves need information or like guidance about something they essentially drag the ghosts of their ancestors back into the realm of the living and either ask them to help defend them via just their martial training um or they just ask them for information and usually the their ancestors aren't very happy with this but they feel obligated to it because it's like a family matter thing and to me that just sounds like necromancy sure it's willing necromancy but it's more willing in the form of uh it being essentially um expected of you expected of a, a noble family to do so and that's problematic because that's just necromancy of extra steps. So I think it's kind of ironic and a bit hypocritical um, of the Dark sure. Elves to think that way. Um, another, another really interesting culture is actually in Hammerfell with the Red Guards because the Red Guards, as you said, their worship of RK is very strong. Although I believe there's uh, their culture has a different uh, God of the Dead that the older. Uh, ancestor worship of there is um, I can't remember their name but one thing that's very interesting is the fact that they hate undead so much that they you can't even interact with undead as in if you are attacked by an undead if you defend yourself you are seen as unclean and you will be shunned in their society for the rest of your existence because you've dealt with the undead and that led to the creation of a sort of nomadic tribe called the Ashaba, which are essentially a group of Red Guards who took it upon themselves to become outcasts to society in order to defend their lands against uh, the undead. Because they realized that a lot of the time, necromancers came to, uh, came to Hammerfell, raised the ancestors and the corpses of the dead against the Red Guards. The Red Guards refused to defend themselves, and so as a result, they lost entire cities with absolute ease. And so the Ashaba essentially took it upon themselves to be the ones to deal with the undead by to getting rid of them, despite being outcasts. And it's, it's kind of like imagining the idea of religion and culture being so prevalent that it, it, it means that you can't even defend yourself against a threat. And that's insane when you place it into that context. But it's also incredibly interesting because it sort of places necromancy as a, a more dedicated force of death in that area specifically rather than everywhere else. Because if the Ashaba aren't available, you can essentially either completely destroy a settlement or even if you lose, that settlement will forever be shamed by the rest of them just for interacting with the dead. That's really interesting. I didn't know about the Ashaba. It's awesome. Yeah, they have a lot of prevalence in the Elder Scrolls Online uh, because you directly interact with them in that. Um, and uh, to be honest, there's a lot of lore regarding necromancy in the Elder Scrolls Online just due to Mana Marco's prevalence. So there's a lot of different things with that. It's also, I believe, um, when there's a body trade, obviously, um, like an, 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 a black market type of thing for bones and corpses, 
And I believe that I read somewhere that the most sought after bodies are those of orcs because they are the strongest of the races naturally. So what happens usually is Bretons end up whenever they go on raids against the orcs in their Orsinium uh, due to the fact that they are so prevalently wanted, as you mentioned, because of their strengths. Uh, they essentially get they essentially have grave robbers go to there, steal them, take them back to High Rock, and then sell them on a black market for different necromancers. And usually, those end up going to Skyrim, because Skyrim's climate makes it easier to preserve them. Yeah, I forgot to mention too that in Ellsware, you're able to get corpses on the black market in Central. Or maybe not the black market, actually, it might just be you know, freely sold there, because apparently they sell everything there. I forgot to mm -hmm. mention that. I think it's definitely, it's very interesting to note that the Khajiit don't really care because yeah. the corpses are essentially, they don't view them as their people anymore. They're just saying, oh, these are just the bodies. So they just bury them in the desert. Yeah. Now, obviously, if this, this might become a problem if they were to rise against and attack them, which does happen in the Elder Scrolls Online again, funnily enough. <laughs> um, but there's quite a lot of necromancers there just due to the fact that they can essentially roam free without persecution because the the, the Khajiit don't really care. Yeah, that's really interesting. All right. Um, I'd like to move on to the volume two of that book because it's really interesting. It talks about skeletons. My so, favorite. Yeah, a favorite. That's right. So basically... Um, I'm talking about Volume 2, The Skeletal Corpse, which is a book from Morrowind. And they say in this book that it's important to use a complete skeleton when you're renovating skeletons, because if the skeleton is missing bones, then you'll get bad results. It doesn't actually tell you what the bad results are, but they make, make, they make it pretty clear that you should use only complete skeletons. And they also say that mostly complete skeletons will work. So I guess it's up to us to kind of speculate on why an inc incomplete skeleton wouldn't work. I guess it's just because it's, you know, it's not going to be working well because it's not going to have that integrity. Like it won't be able to move, I guess. I don't know. What do you think? That makes me sad. That makes me sad because there, whenever I think of necromancy using to complete an incomplete skeleton, I think of... Uh, there's a game on the PlayStation 1, Medieval. I don't know if you're familiar oh, yeah. with it. I know it, yeah. yeah. Yes, but all I imagine is the the point in which a, the, the the main character takes off his head and puts on a skeleton hand to wander <laughs> around small environments. So the fact you can't do that in the Elder Scrolls just makes me sad. Yeah, it's weird. Uh, the next point the book mentions is that magic will assemble the bones properly, but you can also use leather straps and metal spikes to reinforce the skeleton's joints. And this is apparently important because the skeleton minion is weakest at its joints. So that's why you should reinforce the skeleton in these areas. But mm -hmm. a common mistake necromancers make is they bind the joints too tightly and this limits the skeleton's mobility and it can't move anymore. A final point, which is kind of like a big weakness to the skeleton in the Elder Scrolls, is that while most undead can be repeatedly raised, skeletons are often damaged beyond salvation. And this is why such care is needed when preparing a skeleton corpse. I find that kind of interesting and also a shame because I don't see why you couldn't keep reanimating a skeleton as long as the bones are okay. I think that's the main issue with it though. The When you think of a zombie, because obviously their flesh essentially acts as an insulator to their bones, uh, if they're attacked and essentially say sliced off part of their hand or something in combat, the flesh will essentially ensure that they don't get as damaged. But with a skeleton, because they're taking all the brunt force onto um, onto each of their joints or each of their bones, the bones will easily shatter and be destroyed. And I guess that's why it makes them less valuable for reanimation. But I would say that the sheer amount of dexterity that a skeleton can have compared to a zombie would be far more useful. And just as a personal thing the smell surely is better yeah so why would you want to just have a whole rotting environment unless you yourself aren't uh 
smelling due to being a lich or whatever, but <laughs> I, I'll never give up on my skeletal minions. They're always my babies, and I've always preferred them over zombies. Yeah, I love them too. I am also interested for... it's. I, I'm wondering if they ever take into consideration constructs when they're talking about how best to assemble them with leather straps and metal spikes, because when you think about it, assembling a construct is essentially just sticking bits of bone all together to create some kind of monstrosity. And it makes me wonder, do you have to use things like lever straps and pieces of metal welding them together, or can magic alone do it? Because on the one hand, you'd imagine that it would. If you can assemble a skeleton together, then surely it could assemble a, 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 some kind of bone colossus together. But on the other almost all depictions we've seen of bone colossi and things have had uh, reinforcement placed onto it. Though it might just be that they, they're their most valuable minions, so they want them to be the most well-preserved, I suppose. Yeah, the only construct I've seen in the Elder Scrolls from bone is, of course, the Shambles from Oblivion, the Shivering Isles. And mm -hmm. when you inspect them very closely, they've got all kinds of like reinforcements on them, like straps mm -hmm. and... Yeah, I couldn't find any info on those, like no books or anything about them. Um, I believe they were created by, uh, what's her name? There's a, a woman in the Shivering Isles who is created a form of flesh magic, which is not necromancy, apparently. It's different, but it's essentially using flesh to form things. But she also created the shambles as sort of what to do with the discarded bone and such. Uh, but her main thing is that she created flesh atronachs, which are not necromantic because they use a daedric animus to animate them rather than a soul. So they're essentially like a flesh construct, but not. It's 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 weird. It's it flesh magic is different from necromancy apparently in the lore, which is complicated. Um, but there is actually bone constructs which are again seen in the Elder Scrolls online they're used by the worm cult and by Molag Ball and those are what you'd imagine a typical bone construct to look like giant hulking thing made of bone um, and they're used quite and you can in fact you can eat in the necromancer character in the Elder Scrolls online you one of your ultimate abilities transforms you into a bone goliath uh, essentially allowing you to become the giant bone golem and smash enemies down which it's quite amusing to uh to watch but i think that it's uh, for when for the for skyrim and oblivion i think you're right in that the only real construct we've ever seen is the shambles and we never actually see bone constructs themselves but well there's always elder scroll six so we can hope yeah is she also responsible for making the skinned hands i think so i think those are necromantic in their creation but I'm not sure. But I know that all of like the undead creatures in the Shivering Isles were made by her. In fact, I'm going to quickly look up her name while you move on to the next part. Okay. Because it's just interesting because of that book that says, you know, that animals reanimated with necromancy are no good. But the skinned hounds are pretty decent. They're pretty weak, but they don't have any issues following orders. So maybe they are like the animated by a Daedric thing rather than necromancy. Ah, that could make sense. Ah, okay, so her name is Relmina Veranim. And she's the... the she, you, you deal with her in the main quest of the Shivering Isles, but she's essentially just this mad scientist who essentially wanted to create a new form of magic. And she's the one who made the Gatekeeper, uh, which is the most powerful flesh atronach possible. Um, and she even used them to create what she called flesh colossi, which are like uh, flesh atronauts, but even bigger. But uh, again, apparently flesh magic is different from necromancers. And it's like, they call it the sixth element, like fire, water, earth, air, light, and then flesh, which is a strange choice. But then again, we only do get this information from her. And due to her being in the Shivering Isle, she just could just be completely insane we don't know but the fact that she's able to do all of this and claims that it's not necromancy it's using daedric animus is quite the big distinction i would believe yeah all right 
Let's move on to the volume three, The Fresh Corpse, which is about zombies and mummies. This is yet another book from Morrowind. So they say, in situations where decay is too advanced or a skeletal servant is desired, animals can be used to strip the flesh away. And they note that mud crabs are a good option and they can strip a corpse down rapidly. To make a zombie, the corpse must be brought to a suitable location and proper rituals performed. They don't say what kind of rituals or the nature of the rituals or anything like that, unfortunately. Then they go on to say, unlike skeletons that require significant preparation and reinforcement, zombies can be raised repeatedly, even in cases where the corpse has been dismembered. The damaged zombie can be repaired by gathering the missing pieces and sewing them back on and binding damaged bones with leather straps. The zombie is weaker after each repair, but it can be raised dozens of times. Due to the difficulty in acquiring suitable corpses, mummies are preferable to zombies and a mummy can be created by soaking the decaying corpse in a salt or natron bath for at least a month. Internal organs can be removed, but the author notes that he doesn't know any practical benefit from this. And finally, the servant can be wrapped in cloth or linen. And mummies are able to follow commands with more independence and competence, and they're also more powerful. I haven't actually seen any mummies except in Daggerfall, yeah, I think they're only used in the older Elder Scrolls. Uh, when Bethesda took over, prop, uh, when I say when Bethesda, they have always had it. But when they, when Todd Howard uh, became director, I think ever since then, uh, the lore sort of, it diversified from your usual high fantasy of different creatures like, like mummies. Uh, and as a result, we haven't ever seen it. However, uh, I'd imagine if they are doing uh, Hammerfell in Elder Scrolls 6, which there's a lot of hints to, that probably that would be the game where mummies would be prevalent due to obviously there's heavy Egyptian theming in Hammerfell. And so they would, it would be a, a missed opportunity to not include mummies. Though I don't really know how they would really implement them well because obviously they don't have things like pyramids or such. Uh, but then again, it could just be the way that they uh that they deal with their dead but placing them in tombs rather than in pyramid structures yeah elsewhere must be a great place for mummies right oh yeah i'd imagine they would as well they actually do have a they have a little, sort of like a almost an aztec sort of theming with their culture so and obviously there's there's been aztec mummies in real life so i imagine that they probably would do so as well i'm trying to think back um to when i played through the elsewhere campaign of the other schools online i don't think there were mummies in it there were definitely zombies and they were definitely preserved dead and i remember one thing of note from them was that khajiit even when they die they retain their fur their fur doesn't fall off like if, when you think of like a, a zombie or something a normal human one their hair falls out but with khajiit apparently their fur keeps their entire body wrapped up as is and they don't end up losing it except when it's been intentionally stripped away to create a skeleton hmm. so i wonder if that acts as a sort of almost a natural mummy um i don't really know what the insulation would do for their flesh but i suppose if it did work like that then it maybe means that they are better preserved for reanimation um but I, again, I'm not too sure. I don't, just don't remember seeing anything in that kind of culture. A funny thing, though, um, is when they say that damaged zombies can be repaired and, and, and repeatedly reanimated, it just always makes me think, why don't... If they're, if they're capable of just being constantly brought back up and keep on going, why don't people just focus on creating uh, a, a flesh colossi flesh constructs essentially because that seems surely like the better option rather than singular zombies which are weak uh individually and you can have a lot of them but they're just going to be a lot of weak minions which paladins and stuff would surely be able to easily take care of rather than that why not just focus on creating one large flesh colossi and then repeatedly reanimating that flesh colossi because 
surely that way you'd have a lot more insulation to any damage that it gets taken and oh, they're obviously a lot more powerful than a normal zombie then again I suppose it could also just be expertise because it's not really well known on how to make flesh colossi yeah I've, I haven't been able to really find anything about you know what it takes from the the necromancers to be able to make the various minions like I don't know what skills are required um <laughs> I do know how to, uh, like, how necromancy works, as in, like, the metaphysical aspect of it, but I can discuss that later. But for necromancers just wanting to practice, it's essentially just utilizing, um, utilizing a system of words and spells that you already know by heart. So basically it's like a, a, something, a skill that has to be learned and then you can utilize that learned skill to then project a part of your mental energy upon uh, a corpse, which then would reanimate it. So I'm guessing maybe it's just the fact that a lot of necromancers are not as uh, not as well known and don't have as much knowledge when it comes to reanimation in order to make bigger things. But I suppose that's just a sort of uh, gameplay system where you don't have enough magic, even though magic technically doesn't exist. <laughs> okay. The next book I'd like to cover is one from Oblivion. It's called Necromancer's Moon. There's basically information on the necromancy faith called the Order of the Black Worm, which I don't know too much about. So once I'm done reading this, you might be able to fill me in on some of this stuff. And I don't know much about it because I could never stomach the Mages Guild quest line where you have to be against necromancers. So I never really delved into that stuff. <laughs> oh, yes, I can tell you plenty. <laughs> awesome. All right. So basically the book says that Necromancers of the Order of the Black Worm believe in a god of worms that watches over necromancers. Apparently, this person that became the god of worms ascended to godhood and is now known as the Revenant or the Necromancer's Moon. And I think this is a physical moon in like the sky. And the moon can shine down onto an altar. And if the altar has a grand soul gem on it, it will darken that soul gem and turn it into a black soul gem. And the book encourages necromancers to hide in their lairs and accumulate minions until they are summoned by the order to do something. And that's pretty much all the book says. Well, um, the book it essentially is kind of like a, almost like a religious text, I suppose, uh, with how they want to describe the Order of the Black Worm. So, um, firstly, how familiar are you with Manamarco? Not incredibly familiar. Like, I know that he was a badass elf back in the old time who made a gigantic problem for people by doing necromancy army shit and, like, smashing shit up. And I think he's responsible for the bad name that all necromancers now have, but I'm not totally sure. Well, yes, that's correct, essentially. Uh, he, well... It's generally believed in the Elder Scrolls universe that he is the reason necromancy is known to the wider world because he was a part of the Sigic Order, the, the reclusive group of High Elf mages, um, and he was most interested in the school of necromancy, which was forbidden by them, um, and he got outcast by them because of this. But their whole thing was that they thought magic should only be known to the privileged few, the elite, like like all High Elf thinking. Um yeah. So they didn't get... So, so the, the wider world didn't know much about magic and necromancy and such. Mana Marco, he's, he's your generic bad guy. So I want power for power's sake. But his thing is that he wanted to teach necromancy to the lower classes and, and nefarious types. So he believed that everyone should know magic. Not and not just necromancy, just magic in general. So he went after he was kicked out of the mages guild. He went around the world teaching magic to everyone he met, um, which included a lot of nefarious types such as bandits, uh, uh, religious cult leaders, terrible people. But the the idea with his thinking is essentially he wants to spread the concept of necromancy to the world so that they will all view him as the 
as the creator of it. Now, he never created necromancy. It existed long before him, but it was never really known as a school of magic. It was just sort of dark magic that was utilized. Um, but that's kind of his thing. Now, for the God of Worms... Uh, Oh god! So you you said you played Daggerfall, yes? How how far in Daggerfall did you get when you played it? I didn't do any of the main quests that I know of. I basically just roamed around, like exploring dungeons and stuff. I did come across necromancers, and they looked pretty cool. But beyond that, I didn't really. Fair enough. Yeah. Um. So, uh, uh, to put a really long story short, um, after uh. Mana Marco left the, the the Sigic Order. He was followed by his friend. Um, oh God! One second, let me find his name. Uh, Vanus Galarian. That's his name. And he created the Mages Guild, as we know it in the Elder Scrolls today. And he was opposed to Mana Marco because he thinks necromancy is bad. Mana Marco's like, no necromancy, good. I'm a necromancer. Everyone like me. They had a big war together, and Mana Marco became the first ever known lich of the necro of, of the of the elder scrolls world even though he's not the first because the dragon priests are liches and they existed before him but because of how prevalent he was and how linked he is to necromancy he became known as the first of the liches kind of curiously though his method of lichdom is very different to the normal um but i, I can discuss that later but um in daggerfall he wants an object um, which is linked to a giant robot called the Numidium. Uh, God, I don't really want to... I don't want to blabber on about this because it's a long window conversation, but to cut it short, essentially, this object he wanted would allow him to utilize the giant robot to do a thing. And that, and each of the factions in Daggerfall wanted this object, wanted the robot to do a certain thing. Mana Marcos was that he didn't want to just be a lich. He wanted to be the de facto lich. He wanted to become a god. In the Elder Scrolls Online, he tried to do it by essentially tricking um, Molag Ball into giving him enough power so that eventually he could take the Amulet of Kings, the thing used in Oblivion, to essentially challenge the god of of, of destruction, no, no, the god of destruction, uh, the god of domination into a sort of a duel with him, and using the, the, the Amulet of Kings, he would essentially kill him and take his place as the Daedric Prince of Domination. So essentially, Manamarco would become a new Daedric Prince. That didn't end up happening. Uh, he was a fool to think it could. But anyway, but instead, so he went for the Nemidium, the giant robot instead. And so he utilized the object in it to become the god of worms, uh, which, as you said, is a moon, the necromancer's moon, um, because all the gods are represented as a planetary thing. All, all the gods are a planet. Um, and, and like you said whenever the this moon is in orbit what essentially happens is whenever this moon essentially uh covers over the normal moon which is supposed to be rk's influence that's when mana marco has influence over the world and he can um he can do things and that's when he can transform soul gems into black soul gems because he's if, if doing that influence of power uh but to make this even more complicated uh so in oblivion you find man marco and you fight and kill him and that's because there's actually two man marcos oh um God. So it's so. What happened was there was a thing called a dragon break. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but essentially, be, to essentially make all of the endings of uh, Daggerfall canon, uh, Bethesda essentially said all of them happened, but also none of them happened. That's great. And so they created a thing called a dragon break, which is essentially because um the Numidium was a, an object of incredible power it's essentially the the dwarves version of their god um 
because that was activated, that caused time to fracture. And as a result, every single possibility that happened at that time is what happened. So if you brought it to Manamarco, he became the god of worms. If you brought it to the king of Daggerfall, something happened. I can't remember. I only remember Manamarco's side of things. But anyway, because time fractured, all of these... Essentially, the player character essentially gave the, the, the Numidium to everyone. So everyone got their side of it. So that included half of Daggerfall being completely liberated and... Um, the under king regaining his power and and doing things which i don't know wow. but because uh akatosh the god of time doesn't like dragon breaks he then repairs the timeline by making it so that none of them happened so all of these simultaneous events did technically happen but then they also didn't happen. So essentially all that happens for them is in the localized area, a bunch of days are suddenly wiped from people's memories and no one, no one knows what happened. But because of this, there is one timeline in which Manamarco became the god of worms and became the necromancer's moon. And there's another where he didn't and he just stays the, the lich. And because both of these are true, there's now two Manamarcos. There's the one Manamarco walking around as a, a mortal lich, and then there's the god of worms who also exists. <laughs> it's wow. complicated. Yeah, like I knew Elder Scrolls lore was crazy, but I didn't realize it was this crazy. Holy fuck. Oh, it's, it's, it, it gets worse than that, but for necromancy, that's kind of all that matters for Manamarco. And then, yeah, Oblivion happened, and then he gets killed by the main character even though there's there's a theory that the the mana marco you fight isn't actually mana marco and it's actually someone pretending to be him because he's quite an easy fight when you fight him and that could be down to game mechanics we don't know but the theory is that because the last time that they saw mana marco he was a skeletal god lich even though it's been shown in the elder scrolls online he's one of the few liches that can hide his identity and so can just appear as a normal high elf um so it's it's not no there's a lot of retcons a lot of confusion and we don't know whether the actual mana marco was dead or not there's even debate as to whether the necromancer's moon is a thing but because we've seen it happen in oblivion during that quest line we know that the necromancer's moon exists and so as a result that Nec Manamarco the god still exists. It's just it it it's a lot of weird, confusing rhetoric, and I I don't want to go any further on it because <laughs> this video would take hours. Yeah, that's a good idea. All right, I'd like to move on to the lichdom now, which is really interesting. So in Oblivion, there's a book called The Path of Transcendence, and it's a journal left behind by that Celadane. He's that Ultima guy that you have to kill as part of the Dark Brotherhood questline. He's basically a dude who's trying to become a lich. And it describes his, his process of becoming a lich. He doesn't actually become a lich because you kill him, but it's still interesting. So basically, firstly, he describes his agony from having toiled without nourishment or companionship. So maybe loneliness and starvation are prerequisites for, for lichdom, but I don't think so because of what happens later on. Anyway, the phylactery is described as the result of a transfer of a soul into a physical object, and he mentions how in Khajiit fairy tales, a lich can be killed by destroying its phylactery. But he goes on to say that this is all nonsense, and that the phylactery is only important during the process of becoming a lich, and afterwards it's, on, it's inconsequential. The secrets to becoming a lich are described as being never being written down, and they can be only acquired through prayer to the Great Sovereign, which I believe is the Necromancer's Moon. And they're described as being incredibly complex and arcane. The ritual is nearly a week long. The phylactery is constructed, and the Necromancer must carry it around with them everywhere they go. The soul will slowly transfer into the phylactery. The duration of this process is different for everyone, and depends on spiritual and physical factors. If the phylactery is separated from the necromancer during this process, 
the necromancer will die. And that's one of the methods by which you can kill this guy during the quest line is you can pickpocket him and take the phylactery out and he'll just instantly die. So what do you think of that, Jinx? I can't hear you, Jinx, if you're talking. The microphone might have fucked up again. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. There we go. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, where did you Where did you last hear me? Um, not at all since I started reading. Right. Okay. So, um, essentially, the it's it's very interesting because it's quite different to a lot of fantasy worlds where the phylactery is the be all end all for the lich. Um, but it's also interesting for the fact it kind of makes it so that. Um, Liches are different in the Elder Scrolls for the fact that they're stronger in the fact that your phylactery is no longer matters to you. They're also weaker in the fact you can still die as a lich. Yeah. It's 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 weird because the, when you think of a lich, you think of a creature that if you kill it, it doesn't matter because it'll just come back. But the Elder Scrolls is different. The Elder Scrolls that isn't the case. The Elder Scrolls they they just die they're just another undead creature it's just that they gain immortality yeah which is odd because that's very different from usual um but it's believed that there's multiple ways to do it as you said this is one of the ways and this is one of the ways that was told to this particular necromancer in oblivion uh mana marcos was different mana marco apparently did his by purely through alchemical means so instead of utilizing a phylactery um and going through the process of arcane ritual from that he apparently uh, retreated to a cave somewhere had his cult come there with him the cult of the black worm and they essentially cared for him while he did an alchemical procedure which turned him into a lich and this is apparently very different because a lot of the times uh, liches are d different um, they're supposed to be this method of put your soul in the phylactery and then you become a lich after that and that's where all of the liches from like Oblivion and Morrowind and stuff are seen and even the dragon priest from Skyrim but because Manamarco did his through a different method uh it's generally believed that's how he has actual immortality and can hide his appearance because this is different. And that's also why a lot of them view him as like the the main lich because his uh, his lichdom was so much better, essentially, because he got the best of every single world. Right. It's really interesting. I actually wanted to ask you something about the liches in Oblivion. So you know how they're all seen wearing that particular kind of attire? They've got like um, sort of ragged robes and they've got like a funny helmet. Is there any yes. reasoning behind this? Yes, there is. Uh, that's because the, all those liches are uh, liches of the aliens who were the first, uh, the first inhabitants of Cyrodiil. They were essentially high elves that broke off from the high elves and became a different kind. The main difference between them and the High Elves is the Aliens did Daedra worship, um, as well as um, worship of the Aliens, uh, of the, of the uh, Aedra. Um, so their main uh, sovereign was uh, Meridia, the, the, the Daedra Prince of Light and Banishment of the Undead. But they had a whole bunch of Daedra Princes that they worshipped. And they sent, they're the ones who created the White Gold Tower, the, the big city in Oblivion. Um, and they took um, the first humans as slaves um, and essentially tortured them and did horrendous things to them. And eventually they rebelled. Uh, Akatosh became their sovereign deity. And then from there, they were able to wipe out the alien race. But because the aliens were masters of magic, specifically they liked to use magic that was related to the stars. Um, but because they were masters of magic, they were also the first to become liches, as well as, well as the dragon priests. 
um, through different places. But all of the liches that you meet in Oblivion are all remnants of aliens, and so their decor is all what the aliens wore at the time. Um, so those robes and those big crowns and stuff, that's all alien uh, decor, essentially. And that's why they look all the same. But the real reason is, you know, <laughs> the, the Todd Howard had one model and he was just going to use that model. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought that they were meant to be, like, alien liches. It's pretty interesting. Thanks for the info there. You really know a lot about this. Anyway... Um, moving along to the next book it's another book that you can find in both Oblivion and Skyrim and it's called The Black Hearts on Trial and basically it's a debate between the major skilled members as to why necromancy should be banned and it's, inter it's interesting to us because it claims that necromancy is inherently evil so basically Master Karalis describes necromancy as being inherently dangerous and says that the simplest spell requires the spilling of blood and corrupts the practitioner's soul. He says this is a fact and it's not conjecture. And he's not debated on this. The, the pro-necromancy people he's like talking to seem to like just accept this fact as well. So I think we can conclude from this is that necromancy in the Elder Scrolls is basically evil and there's no way to be a good necromancer. By the way, Jinx, I can't hear you if you're talking. Am I heard? Yeah, can hear you again. Apologies. This, this episode's going to be a nightmare for you to edit. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, so, yes, um, you're correct. Um, unlike a lot of fantasy worlds, the unique thing about the Elder Scrolls is the fact that necromancy is only possible through soul manipulation there's no way to channel pure magic into someone in order to do necromancy um and this is due to a a, a, a cosmological thing called the spiritual umbilicus get ready for this wow so the spiritual umbilicus is a uh uh, essentially a, a, a spiritual link that ties a soul to its direct body, the one that it had while it was alive. The recently deceased have a strong spiritual, yeah, spiritual umbilicus because they are making their way to their afterlife. The long dead have very weak ones because they have been in their afterlife for a long time, so as a result they don't need it. So how a necromancer essentially raises a corpse is they essentially take this spiritual umbilicus and they pull at the soul because they know where the soul is, they know which afterlife it's in. So they essentially try and yank it out of their afterlife or if they're on their way to their afterlife, they yank it before it gets there and tries to force it back into the body. Now, this means that the stronger uh, spiritual umbilicus is, the more of a struggle it is to put it back in the body. And as a result, that means that it's far more horrendous and painful for the soul in question, because apparently they can feel this happening. So, uh, recently deceased have very strong spiritual umbilicus, and as a result, they have a lot of torment that goes into them when they get pulled back. But that also makes them the strongest, because it means that they essentially keep most of their... Uh, abilities and most of their memories and such uh, and that allows them to become more of a useful minion essentially so when you say in Skyrim kill someone and then immediately reanimating them you're doing what is essentially the most painful method for bringing them back and that's very evil <laughs> um, but if you if you wanted to be more on the more grey area then uh the evil, then you would want to target bodies that are very, very long deceased because their spiritual umbilicus is very weak. So when they take this spiritual umbilicus, the weak one, they can then use that to pull back the soul into it. But because it's very weak, it means that there's not a lot of struggle putting the back in. So rather than inflicting pain on them, you're essentially just making it so that they go back very easily. 
And this is this is essentially how necromancy works on a, a, a cosmological level for the Elder Scrolls. And a lot of my teach, a lot of this has been taught by a, a more, I say morally good, it's not morally good, possible to be good, a morally grey necromancer called Vastari, um, also known as the Witch of Azura, who was a friend of Manamarco, but who split off from his cult when she realized that he was just generic evil bad guy. So she tried to use necromancy in as nice of a way as she could. So she never used strong and spiritual umbilicus. She only used weak ones. And she also barely ever used minions. She only really used it to, co- to communicate with the dead so that essentially she could get information from them and then let them go without causing much harm. Um, and funnily enough, she is also the reason why black soul gems exist because she... Came, she went to the Daedric realm of Cold Harbor, where Molag Ball is, uh, and on one of her trips, she found a Black Soul Gem, brought it back to show Mana Marco. Now, she wanted to use this to essentially figure out how to create um, a, a way to essentially extend life and also help to uh, put magical energy inside of these objects so that they could be utilized to power things. Um, Mana Marco instead saw it as a way to put human souls into soul gems. Uh, and that was evil of him and not what at all what she wanted for it. So she then decided to abandon him at that point. But because souls are directly used all the time, yeah, you're correct that necromancy is almost always utilized. Uh, it's always evil but the only time where i could think of it being even considered morally okay is again if you consider the ancestor worship of the dark elves to be morally okay because they directly tell their descendants that they're okay with coming back but in the end it's still necromancy so yeah okay that's very interesting so the next book is one you can find in Morrowind, Skyrim, and ESO. It's called RK the Enemy. And it's pretty much just another one of these preachy necromancer books from the Order of the Worm. And it goes on to describe that RK's blessing prevents the souls of humanoids from being used by necromancers without their consent. The only issue I have with the book is that it doesn't tell like how or like why or anything like that. Maybe you can fill in this missing information. I'm not too sure with the exact uh, methodology they utilize, but I know that um, divine rites and whatever are performed upon death in order to help prevent them from rising from the dead. It's used a lot in Redguard culture. They do like ceremonial rites and stuff in order to stop necromancers from raising corpses. Um, and when that happens, usually that prevents them from being... Uh, utilized without an extremely powerful necromancer because a lot of the time necromancers can break through these uh, these seals, these these passages of rites. Um, but it usually depends uh, a lot on um, how powerful the necromancer is and how powerful the priest is that did this in the first place. Right. Interesting. All right. So the next book is called Arundel's journal and it's from Skyrim and it's a journal of this necromancer who lives near Dawnstar and he's been like making a whole heap of ghosts and stuff basically um, he describes the process of making minions as enslavement of the soul and he also talks about groping and filling up his ghostly lovers and how it will leave the necromancer feeling invigorated it's kind of a funny book (laughs) <laughs> this Arundel, oh my god, is this the, oh, this is the creep necromancer, I remember this. Yeah. This dude is insane. He's, uh, <laughs> he's a necrophiliac. Yep. He, he, oh. Oh, oh okay. welcome. That explains something. Well, you've come in at a perfect time, my friend. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ar- Arundel was a, uh, a very creepy dude who, 
Essentially, he was the incel of the Elder Scrolls universe. No girls liked him, and everyone hated him. So he decided to become a necromancer, kill a whole bunch of women, raise them as his undead concubines, and then uh, did wonderful things with their spiritual bodies and their corpses. Oh, he was a he was a jolly individual. Was his sole reason for for becoming a necromancer just so he could do that shit? Yeah. That's essentially wow. why he did it. <laughs> Motherfucker. <laughs> Welcome, so high. I'm glad you arrived. At the rather this that wondrous fucking, time. A alarm clock fucked with... Well, actually, no. I woke up, and then I, like, put my head on back of the bed for a second, and then I guess my deprivation caught up with me and made me go for an extra hour. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, it's happens. fine. You'll be able to fill in the silence when my microphone dies again because apparently <laughs> my microphone hates me today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So the the next book is called The Exodus, and it's you can find it in Oblivion and Skyrim. And it's a story about a couple with a sick daughter who seek necromancers for aid after being turned away by all the official channels like the Mages Guild and Alchemists and whatever else. So they basically. I hear from some off-the-grid alchemist that there might be some mages who can help them, and they are called the Mages Guild of Olenveld, and turns out that it's in an obscure and forgotten location. There's, like, no records of it. You can't find it on any, like, modern maps. They were only able to find its location in this old book, and turns out it's a day's sail from Winterhold, and basically to heal the sick girl, the necromancers kill her, and reanimate her to the horror of her parents. It's a pretty interesting story. And I, I wanted to ask you guys, like, do you know anything about this this um, Mages Guild of Olenveld? No, this is the first time I've ever heard of them. So this Same. totally this totally sounds like the type of thing where they would go, well, technically she's better. <laughs> yeah. Mm. It's really interesting, though. Like, I, I want to find this place and visit it. Perhaps we, uh, no doubt, there's probably a mod somewhere that does something like this. Yeah. Yeah, if it doesn't exist, there's probably a, ma a mod for it. Yeah. I... You guys should read that book. It's it's quite a good one. Mm. All right. The the next book is also a good one, and you can find it in Morrowind, Oblivion, and Skyrim. It's called Pala. Mm. As a story about a mage who finds a necromantic relic and uses it to revive a creature. So basically, the mage finds a black disc with orange runes on it, and he thinks it's cool and stashes it away in his pocket. And then he falls in love with a statue of a woman fighting some kind of monster. And he learns that uh, the, the monster is called Pala, but he doesn't realize this and he gets the name wrong. The, he thinks that the, the woman is called Pala, but it's actually the monster that's killing her. And basically, he like resurrects Pala, who he thinks is this woman, using this black disc, and then he realizes, this, oh shit, I've resurrected this uh, monster instead because he like, he's another perverted incel necromancer basically. He wanted to resurrect this woman because he liked her. He ends up resurrecting mm. the monster instead. <laughs> <laughs> and it's pretty funny, but um, the nature of the resurrection isn't clear, like, the book doesn't say whether the Pala thing comes back as a rotting corpse or whether it's living again, it only says that whenever he's using the magic, he can smell, like, rotting stench and stuff like that. Do you guys know anything about, like, this kind of necromancy that can either bring someone back properly, or is that impossible? Can they only come back as, like, rotting husks? I'm pretty sure they can't come back. I'm I'm pretty sure that yeah. every single story of people trying to bring people back just always ends up with them bring, being brought back as a zombie because mm -hmm. that's wonderful storytelling. The fact it's a black disc with orange runes on it though makes me think it's Daedric because that's that's what that sounds like. It's so either Daedric or or I'm thinking some weird fucking looking ass uh, black gem with some weird runes on it. It's mm -hmm. either what it's either Daedric or that shit. The yeah. fact is the or, the fact it's orange runes makes me think it's uh, it's Daedric. It, I, I 
I would imagine that the Daedra, well, the Daedra do use necromancy, but they use their own form of it because Daedra don't have souls. They have, uh, oh God, what are they called? Vestiges? No. Is that right? Hold on. Let me look this up. <laughs> Kinky. <laughs> I love how these books are about incel necromancers. It's pretty funny. Because it tends to be. <laughs> uh, one second. Uh, 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 is it just an animus? Is that what it's called? Daedric animus. That's it. Yes. Yeah, so a daedric animus. Um, a, 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 a daedric animus is also known as a vestige that's it so when a daedra dies it doesn't actually die um it gets it, it's vestige it's soul if you want to call it gets pulled back to oblivion and then gets remade into a new creature so the all the daedra don't have individual personalities they essentially just act as primordial goo that makes creatures and the Daedric Princes are the ones that give them that form. Um, so, necromancy for them is essentially just bringing back the already their corpse. I imagine they can do so by just um, filling it essentially with another uh, vestige rather than relying on a normal human soul. But I suppose that would be the ultimate insult to use a human soul inside of a Daedra. Uh, but yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if like it would be classified as necromancy or if it would just be a, a an inherently Daedric thing. Um, but they do utilize it just in very subtle ways. Like, Molag Ball is one of the most famous ones. He uses necromancy all the time. He's the father of vampires. Um, and a lot of un he controls a lot of undead um and i think that's just mainly due to the fact that the inherent nature of their uh their creation is that they're not exactly alive in the first place they're just sort of things that are molded into clay objects and it's only the daedric princes that are truly alive in the realms of oblivion hmm also i feel like it would be a bigger insult for like Imagine just being a Daedra, and you're just doing your own thing, you're a Dramora Lord, you're just kind of doing your own thing, you're guarding this one place. A chuckle fucking, like, orange pants and a blue hood with a big-ass fucking staff points at you, and you're now a scamp. Because <laughs> he found out the goddamn formula of the primordial goo, and he now knows how to mold you, just like the fucking dudes. That sounds about right. Actually, there's a... Uh... A thing with the fact that if, whenever you summon a bound weapon um, in the games, it's act, it's not just summoning a ghost sword. What it's doing is it's taking uh, a vestige, a, a Daedric soul, and essentially forming oh. it in the form oh, no. of a weapon rather than in the form of any kind of Daedric creature. So when you use a bound sword, you're using a Daedra in the form of a sword. <laughs> I fear for those Daedra who have kinky masters. Yep. Oh, Daedric dildo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, that sounds about right. <laughs> All right, guys, I got one last book, and then I'm going to give like everything over to you because I know that Sohai has a lot to say about Morrowind. Because you're like the big expert on that, well, the whole mod and all that. Uh, I, I I cannot say that I actually do have a lot. I did play mod. It did uh, have a lot of... It was trying to be as lore consistent as possible, but I'm pretty sure they still also did some fucky leeway because some things do not add up to what I'm reading in the necromancy here. Yeah. I can't really say I actually know too much all about the necromancy there. It's... I only know, I, I'm not even sure how much I know is or accurate because of that mod. Yeah. All right. So. Probably interesting to hear about it regardless. Yeah, yeah. I agree. The last book right. is called Souls Black and White, and you can find it in Oblivion and Skyrim. It basically describes the difference between white and black souls. Basically, all creatures, living or dead, are powered by a soul. Souls can be contained inside soul gems. And two types of soul exist, white souls, which are lesser souls belonging to animals, and black souls, which are powerful souls that belong to humanoids. And black soul gems are dangerous because 
if the gem is not precisely the size of the encased soul, like maybe the gem is a bit bigger, then uh, there's room left in it. And when you handle it, your soul can partially seep into the gem. And this makes me wonder if like an animal could be killed while it sleeps by just leaving a soul gem on it, because theoretically its soul would be drawn into it. And mm -hmm. because of all this mm -hmm. and, and how all creatures living or dead are powered by a soul, I guess it would mean that all necromancy must involve soul gems somehow, even if all the other books haven't mentioned this yet. Um, I'm not sure if it needs to use yeah. a soul gem, but it's it's inherently linked to it. Um, and it's kind of why necromancy is tolerated in a lot of provinces, because of the fact that soul gems are required for enchanting. Enchanting is incredibly important to most of the cultures. And even if it's technically necromancy, because it's soul manipulation, they still utilize it. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. From Skyrim, you can go around, just sap somebody's fucking uh, soul, the black gem, and you're just able to reanimate the body itself before, True. you know, it com completely rots away. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, there, there is a bit of leeway with that. Maybe what they're kind of referring to more is the fact that to, you know, manipulate them more to a higher degree would actually require an extensive bit of, uh, you know, soul manipulation, like... Remember like those those fucking shades from that uh, from like that one Skyrim quest, one uh, like Meridia's beacon, where the fuck it was. Oh uh, yes. She drags you to her uh, home, and it's like, yo, there's a necromancer living under my house. This is heresy in like eleven different fucking levels. Deal with it, and you just basically just find a necromancer who has like a shit ton of shades. And that begs the question: is like, how the fuck did they get that many shades, and how did they make them? Probably soul manipulation. Ah, no, there is an explanation for that. Um, uh -oh. If you look at the shades, you'll see a lot of them are wearing Stormcloak and Empire uniforms. Uh, oh. Basically, there was a battalion that was sent there from each side to fight uh, over something. I don't know. But all of their bodies were... When this necromancer arrived, he killed all of the battalions that were there. And then the shades are the ghostly reanimated forms of all the soldiers that were there. So the best way to bring the Stormcloaks and the Empire together is to kill them and have them work alongside each other in ghost form. That's awesome. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, this is the way of necromancer logic. Yes. That yes, so that, that image there has got, that guy's got a Stormcloak helmet on, and there's other ones that have, like, Empire, uh -huh. Empirical helmets on as well. Um, yeah. uh, that guy, I think the reason why he was able to get so many of them was because he was directly using Meridia's... Uh, Meridia's um, uh, uh, artifact, the uh, the Dawnbreaker, he corrupted it intentionally and used its power to essentially uh, control um, those shades. That's why he has such that amount of power, and that's why he can also turn into a shade himself at the end of the quest. Mm. Uh, uh. That's what that is. I got one question for you guys, and I mentioned the Jinx earlier on a bit, but we didn't delve into it yet. Basically, in all of these books, and maybe the Elder Scrolls Online says something. I didn't get any books for for any Elder Scrolls Online stuff because I knew that this would be long enough as it is just with Morrowind, Oblivion, and Skyrim. So I just got books from those games. But there's no mention of how ghosts are made, like how a necromancer would summon a ghost. Do you have any speculation on that? I do know that there is a physical element to it because ectoplasm is a, a physical thing that you can utilize. True. But I don't know how... I'm guessing whatever ectoplasm is, it's maybe a substance that can hold human memories or a soul and you can utilize it to form a sort of physical body for a ghost. That's why ghosts can hurt you because and why you can hit them with certain objects. So my guess is that they, whatever ectoplasm is, they utilize it as a sort of, like, a, a gel of sorts, place a soul within the gel, and then use necromancy to form this gel into a ghostly body. And then because of the unique properties of the gel, it's able to take on the aspects of a ghost. So can't be hurt by normal weapons, but can be hurt by things like silver weapons or such. That's just one theory, though. I'm actually not sure how they indirectly use it. I am trying to think. Um, 
but there's also like a shit ton of just fucking um what's it called I, I, I think no a ghost could also probably like be like a much more natural occurring thing for some reason because throughout Morrowind there is a fuck ton of tombs that also have a lot of ghosts as well as in certain like Dwemer areas where you know still being guarded by Dwemer constructs you will find every now and then a Dwemer ghost kind of doing his own fu- uh, Dw- uh, Dwemer Spectre uh, mm-hmm. doing his own fucky thing but there's obvious there's obvious signs that no Necromite has been here because you know his, his the constructs are, are still there, but the Dwemer ghost is somehow able to say "fuck you, I'm here." Yeah, I think that might be linked directly to their weird uh, the reason why they're they disappeared. There's speculation that when they uh, to 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 place a very long story short, when they did the thing that made them all disappear. Uh, they didn't actually die, they just ascended to a higher form of existence, and so some of them might still be here in the form of a ghostly figure, like an afterimage, but that's just one theory. Uh, the Dwemer are an entire thing <laughs> that need okay. an entire thing to talk about. Because I-, I was about to say, that sounds like Ideal Master bullshit right there in of itself. Oh, you want to talk about the Ideal Masters? I'll tell you about the Ideal Masters. <laughs> Where'd you find that much fucking info of them then? There's, we only know like a little about them. Well, so if you want, I can just tell you what the Ideal Masters are and, and how they came to be if you're if you're Fuck intrigued. it, sure. This is kind of what the podcast is kind of for. All right. So the Ideal Masters are essentially a group of mages, or ne- I can't remember if they were necromancers exactly, but they're mages anyway. Mm-hmm. But a long time ago, they didn't say when, they decided that they wanted to essentially form a sort of group of people to become the most powerful mages that they could. So they worked together, and eventually they came across the concept of transferring their souls into objects, but not in the form of lichdom. They went about it in a different way. And they essentially got rid of their physical bodies and became incorporeal creatures. They then utilized all of their magical capabilities to create a pocket of oblivion. Because oblivion is just basically a primordial chaos, uh, they essentially just took some of this primordial chaos and made a small zone of it as their own. And this zone became um, the Soul Cairn. And the Soul Cairn is the place where souls go. Uh, It's essentially a a place of decay, death, and necromantic energy. Um, And what they work with is essentially the Ideal Masters, they now look like giant crystalline, they just look like giant crystals, they don't have physical forms anymore. Um, ah, those fuckers. Yes. But what they do is they work with necromancers to essentially gain power in exchange for soul gems with souls in them. But they only care about black souls because they only care about human souls. They don't care about animal souls. Well, they do sometimes, but most of the time it's human souls. So they work a bit like a, a, bit like a, a, a merchant's group for necromancers. You, they have incredible necromantic power and knowledge. You get this ne- great necromantic power and knowledge from the Ideal Masters by trading them black soul gems filled with human souls. And then they utilize that to increase their own power. And when that happens, uh, you can get this power from them. But most of the time, the, the, because these are very evil individuals, the, the Ideal Masters, they don't... Uh, keep up their end of the bargain or they make a monkey's paw situation where you get what you want but not the way you wanted it uh Mm. like a great example of this is the dragon dernavir oh yeah so uh uh chab did you ever play through dawn guard no so in 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 dawn guard um at one point you visit the soul cairn because you have to rescue uh, a very ancient vampire lady but she's guarded by a dragon called Dernavir, and turns out Dernavir is like an undead dragon. He's like a rotting zombie dragon. Uh, and you need to defeat him in order to uh, get this vampire lady out. Um, but it, she, she even says you can't ever properly kill him because he's just come back to life because the ideal masters have him there. 
But the reason why he's there in the first place is because he essentially he during the dragon wars he wanted to learn how to use necromancy so he could utilize his power to gain dominion over other creatures so he said so the ideal masters struck a deal with him they're like okay sure give us a whole bunch of souls so he did and then it's like great okay so we'll teach you how to do necromancy on one condition there's this vampire lady well they, they, they just said there's this lady here She's trapped inside a prison. We need you to be her guard. And then when she dies, we'll let you go. And then you can utilize your powers in the mortal world in, outside of in Oblivion. And he's like, cool, okay, that's fine. What they didn't tell him is the fact that she's a vampire. And as a result, she's immortal. <laughs> so as a result, he realized he was trapped because he couldn't get out of this realm of oblivion because the ideal masters tricked him into looking after this woman until she dies and she won't ever die because she's immortal oh, the and by the time by the time you rescue her it turns out that because he's been in the soul cairn for so long his body is essentially attuned to that pocket realm of oblivion so he can't actually leave because if he leaves he'll just disintegrate and return back to oblivion like a normal daedra does wow so bit of a sad thing the ideal masters are dicks um mm. but the other thing about the soul cairn in particular is whenever you use uh a black soul gem in something like enchanting or something the soul from that that's used in that process ends up going to the soul cairn as a as a, a member of it essentially so the soul cairn is filled with a whole bunch of ghosts of people and creatures and stuff um, and those are all people who were captured in a black soul gem and then that soul gem was then used in enchanting or something else and the leftover remains of the soul were given into the soul cairn where they toil in agony for the rest of their days a very sad fate for them and uh, yeah uh, I was about to say it's like I recall some bits of that but I can't recall why the fuck the uh ideal masters want to, would want to have so uh souls because I'm not sure if there like there is some power but i think it's actually given by the ideal masters when they do some fucking enchanting yeah essentially they're just power for power's sake because they're not very well written but that's or. essentially what they are <laughs> they're they're just essentially a group of powerful mages who got rid of their bodies made their own realm of oblivion and then made that the place where souls go and where necromancers go to do business deals essentially all right i got another question for you guys so you know how in skyrim there's that one warlock he's he's called a warlock not a necromancer and he's basically got this dungeon and there's all these like ghostly people around it begging for like release and when you go in there's like a, a trap door with like a chest on it and if you ah, yes. if you approach the chest, then you fall down, end up in a cage. Um, what is with that guy? Is he doing necromancy, or what's he doing? From my knowledge, I think he's just doing human experimentation because he wants he wants live subjects. So that's why he keeps them in a cage. Uh, and I guess he just does necromancy if his subjects die. Uh, I can't remember if he has any actual story behind him, but it's it's not to do necromancy specifically. I think it's to do human experimentation and just the subjects that die, he just reanimates their ghosts and then they fight for him and defend him. Hmm. He doesn't have any kind of skeletons or zombies in his dungeon. He's only got those ghosts. No. Maybe he's like not, a, as you said, he's a warlock, not a necromancer. So maybe he's just like, he doesn't have a lot of knowledge on necromancy. So it's just like, oh, I can, I can keep the soul here. I'll let them do that while I, uh, and not have to bother with minion management or something like that. Yeah. Uh, oh, right. That was fucking, uh, this is weird. I'm, I'm trying to think back to, um, uh, doing some Morrow and shit. And using like an actual spell you can like have right off the bat which is summon ancestral ghost which mm -hmm. is an actual version of the ghosts that are flo floating around in those uh tombs that also when you kill them they drop ectoplasm yes that's... i'm getting this is getting more confusing 
the yeah. ans- the ancestral ghosts. I think that's the dark elf specifically. They have a yeah. They've got a unique thing with their ancestors, where their ancestors essentially work on a system that they they pref- they don't call it necromancy because necromancy is evil, and they're not doing it because it's evil, but. It- it's necromancy. Uh, the, the ancestor spirits can get called back at any point to uh, help out their descendants, uh, either by fighting alongside them or by just by giving them advice. And they're kind of expected to do so. It's just kind of a cultural thing for them. Apparently, fucking anyone can bring it back, though, because you get the spell Wrath of At if you play as a Breton, not a Dark Elf or anything related to that. You just get to ancestral ghost time. And you summon one out of nowhere as well. <laughs> Do I smell inconsistency? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> makes it conf- makes it more fucking confusing to the whatever the souls are. Oh god. Are they actual people or is that shit only in soul gems? We're just seeing fucking things that have memories of a person. I got another question for you guys. So oh. the I believe, to my knowledge, the game that we've seen the most ghosts or the most kinds of ghosts must be Oblivion because you've got those standard little ghosts that throw like the ice bolts or whatever. Then you've also got those various kinds of wraiths. And I don't know what Morrowind has in terms of ghosts. Maybe it has more ghosts than Oblivion. I'm not sure. But- no, in terms of ghosts, we just have um, a, a lot of ancestor ghosts floating around, some dwarven specters. You can maybe the bone lord but i think the bone lord is a fucky weird construct so i'm not even sure you can actually call him it's just two types for here yeah and skyrim with, with this yeah sorry and skyrim no, it, it's got, fine it's just yeah so, sorry <laughs> yeah and skyrim is little it's a little fucky yeah because uh, there are normal variants, but they also have stronger and stronger variants. I I smell fuckers who don't want to model more. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. I was just going to say that Skyrim's got the Wisp Mother and just those um, sort of people that look like they're kind of ghostly looking. And Oblivion has those two in the Shivering Isles. There's like a fortress with those kind of ghostly looking people in it. Uh, yes. There's an interesting theory surrounding Wisp Mothers, actually. Uh, so, the the theory is that the Wisp Mothers are the sole remains of the um, the Snow Elves. That, due to the 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 dwarves, the Dwemer, um, you know the Falmer in in Skyrim, the 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 like goblin looking creatures that live in in dwarven ruins and such yeah well they used to be snow elves which were just another form of high elf but they went to skyrim and thus became snow elves um yeah. or maybe they were before then i actually can't remember but anyway um I, i'm trying to remember that one fucker did say during the dongar quest line um i can't actually recall what the exact cause was but i'm pretty sure they were normal and then shit went fucked. Like uh, that one, that uh, one dude got like uh, some almost about to be a vampire or some shit, and yes. also caused a lot of them to turn on each other, and it basically just caused a bit of a good amount of slaughter. They were fucking ruined all their temples and shit. Yeah, that was in that connection to the temple. That, yeah, that was in that one temple where basically the the because one of them turned into a vampire, uh, he started commanding them. But the actual the snow elves just looked like white skinned hyals essentially uh but the reason the falmer are the same species but they've devolved and the reason why is because when the nords uh when the nords came to skyrim to essentially settle there there was a big thing that happened called i think it was called the night of a thousand tears where basically the snow elves got paranoid about the humans and thought they were going to kill them all so they killed them all and so the oh. humans the humans went to another continent, came back with an army and slaughtered the Snow Elves. And when the Snow Elves essentially realized they couldn't win their fight, they uh, they went to the dwarves, the Dwemer, and begged them to let them stay in their underground fortresses so they couldn't get attacked, killed by the, the humans. So they did. 
under one condition. And that condition was that they would eat a fungus that the dwarves gave them as their like main source of food. So they went, okay, that's fine. But then, as it turned out, the fungus turned them blind and made them more gaunt, and they became weaker. And then, oh, from, yeah. and then from there, the, dwer- the dwarves made them a slave race, essentially. Um, but here's what's interesting. So, uh, as you mentioned before, there's two different types of souls. There's white souls and, and, and black souls. Uh, and the black souls are human souls, which are, or humanoid souls, I should suppose I should say. Um, and all elves have them, including the snow elves. The Falmer, however, have white souls, the type that are used in animals. But they're the same creature. They're just devolved. So you might ask, how does the soul change from one color to another? That's surely not how it works. So the reason is gameplay, but we're going to ignore that. The theory is that the fungus and experimentation that the dwarves are doing on the Falmer were not just making them a slave race by blinding them. The theory is that the, whatever experimentation they were working on was also to change their soul type. And the reason being is the Dwemer were interested in becoming gods. They wanted to ascend their mortal forms and become gods. So if they had an entire race to practice their soul manipulation on, they could essentially figure out the dangers of soul manipulation before doing it themselves. And it's believed that the Wisp Mothers are the ghostly remains of the original Snow Elves after their souls had been manipulated. And that's why Wisp Mothers are usually seen in and around Dwemer ruins or Falmer encampments. Hmm. It's really interesting. All speculation though, right? Yes, it's all theory at the moment because there's no hard evidence at this, but yes, that's the that's the yeah. theory. Trevor, it that that is a little fucky because you can also still find Wisp Mothers in other locations as well as you know they're all female i smell mm. fucking daedric only females can become true blood some bullshit <laughs> all right guys we're approaching the one hour and a half mark any closing points on all this uh i guess i could just say that I really enjoy the Elder Scrolls Necromancy. I find that there's unfortunately not a lot of interesting characters to talk about when it comes to Elder Scrolls Necromancy. Mana Marco is the main one that everyone talks about. And as I mentioned before, Vastari is pretty much the closest that they have to uh, a good necromancer. Funnily enough, she is also a lich, uh, but doesn't eh. look like but look doesn't look like a lich like Mana Marco. Again, never explained why. She just said, "Oh yeah, she became a lich," but never goes more uh, into that um but i think that this it's it's distinctive enough from normal necromancy systems that it's interesting and the fact that you can only do necromancy through soul manipulation thus making it inherently evil is an interesting take on it but it leaves a lot to be desired when it comes to you know making interesting characters because they're almost quite literally can't be good and not aligned necromancers in this world essentially yeah that's it, that it, yeah i'm trying to think i don't know that that does still feel kind of fucky because again you could still raise bodies without souls i'm not sure if it's direct without soul manipulation i think you can also deal some shit with the body as well like flesh asian arcs oh that, but it is that yeah that's flesh magic that's that's daedric souls being put into bodies and that's that's a whole uh, other, I, yeah. I mentioned earlier the podcast like flesh magic is different from necromancy and that makes no <laughs> sense and, yeah <laughs> yeah um a, about like interesting necromancy characters is also potema you know her mm, the wolf queen yes yes kink Although, you know, her whole thing is, I'm going to take over the world! How well, is that different from Mana Marco? Uh, that I'm going to take over the world! <laughs> yeah. I have Wolf in my name. <laughs> yeah, sadly, that's pretty much how what well, most of it boils down to, right? It's just like that kind of, I'm going to take over the world type of thing. Yeah, they don't really have a lot of distinctive uh, characters. 
the va- it's fun enough the vampires probably get the more interesting characteristics and they technically are necromancers as well but oh. when it comes to people who are dedicated necromancers yeah they don't get a lot of character development in this unfortunately so that's something yeah one it's like vampires have no relation to necromancy right because it's just a disease it's uh, uh, <laughs> kind Might've. of so it's like not it- really it's necromancy because it's not the dead body being raised but it's influence from Molag Ball who himself is a big necromancer so it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's kind of fucky so wait they're not necromancers then like there's no necromancy uh, I think uh, they can do necromancy because they are undead, technically, hmm. but their vampirism is technically not a necromancy thing. Like, a necromancer can't inflict someone with vampirism. Only Molag Ball and another vampire can do that. But their yeah. undead nature makes them uh, more able, essentially, to do necromancy. Oh yeah, when you become a fucking vampire lord, you get to have a free raise uh, uh, undead spell. Yeah. Although it's pretty fucking weak. It's actually not that useful at all. <laughs> That's why you want to use the gargoyles. They're far more interesting. <laughs> yeah. All right, one more question. So I'm pretty sure when you kill a skeleton or whatever, or a zombie in Oblivion or whatever game has them, and you soul trap them, you get a white soul. But when you do it to a vampire, you get a black soul, right? Yes, you're correct. This is, wouldn't this mean that um, undead have white souls and vampires are not undead because they've got black souls? To, to this, I would, I would present to you a statement is that <laughs> you should ask Todd Howard what this exactly is question is, uh, because vampires don't have souls. That's oh, why oh. they're vampires. Oh, 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 oh. So, so, yeah, <laughs> don't, don't bother. All right. Well, this has been <laughs> a great podcast. I think it'll be really interesting for anyone who's making um, like a necromancy mod for one of these games just to like Indeed. get some info on how to make it all work before they begin. What do you guys think? I think so too. And I think that we, if there one doesn't exist, that they need to make, uh, oh, what the hell was that island? The name of the island that you mentioned earlier. The uh, the, the Jeering Isles? No, no, no. Um, the what Mage's was... Guild of Olenveld. Yeah. Oh, that one. Yeah. Be a thing if it is not already a thing. I don't know. I haven't checked. Yeah. I'm going to check uh, right after the podcast. Actually, I'll do it now. Why yeah. Not? Yeah, yeah. Also, I also saying like that, how that one, uh, that one fucking woman is, uh, the only good, um, uh, so far necromancer, uh, and how she's a lich, uh, Vesteri. I, f- I think that, well, and this is me just completely spitballing. It could just be they may have, they may have uh, lifted a little bit of the fucking, the, D- the D and the arch lich who are people who, uh, who become uh liches but they're they're good and they ha- they don't have any soul requirement but it's a kind of a harder process and it's more secret and kept because not that many people want to go through that process but i think it also said like that they, they actually uh kind of keep some of their physical features like i think their skin will still stay tied to their body uh i'm, I'm misremembering but i'm pretty sure i call that so they still look physically better than an actual lich in terms of how their body goes over time it's so, vesteria might be a case of an arch lich but i'm not too sure actually she does have links to azura she's a priestess of azura so maybe that also is what helps her retain her physical appearance um i'm not quite sure but i think it, mm. that might very you might very well be correct because uh the elder scrolls started off as just uh an idea for a D&D campaign that the developers at the time had, and then they just made their own game out of it, and then it's just spiraled into this. That's why a lot of elements are really similar. You know, Daggerfall right, feels like right. a D&D game when you play it. Yeah, you know. it's very much like it. And hey, look at that. There is an Olinveld. There you go. I mean, it's it's just an empty island, but it's yeah. something. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Like, 
Uh, there's two. There's a really old mod from like six years ago that hasn't mm -hmm. been updated, and it looks like it's probably maybe not worth trying because it looks abandoned. But there's this other one that's in the works, apparently. Maybe. Oh. No. I hope mm. so. I, I hope someone makes a mod on that because it's going to be awesome. <laughs> anyway, guys, thanks for being on the podcast. No. Apologies about the microphone issues. No <laughs> Sorry about that showing up earlier. It's all right. It happens. All right. Bye, everyone. Later. Later.